The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne Chapter 3 The First Customer Miss Hepzibah Pinchon sat in the oaken elbow chair, with her hands over her face, giving way to that heavy down-sinking of the heart which most persons have experienced, when the image of hope itself seems ponderously moulded of lead on the eve of an enterprise at once doubtful and momentous. She was suddenly startled by the tinkling alarm, high, sharp, and irregular, of a little bell. The maiden lady arose upon her feet, as pale as a ghost at cockcrow, for she was an enslaved spirit, and this the talisman to which she owed obedience. This little bell, to speak in plainer terms, being fastened over the shop-door, was so contrived as to vibrate by means of a steel spring, and thus convey notice to the inner regions of the house when any customer should cross the threshold. Its ugly and spiteful little din, heard now for the first time, perhaps, since Hepzibah's periwigged predecessor had retired from trade, at once set every nerve of her body in responsive and tumultuous vibration. The crisis was upon her. Her first customer was at the door. Without giving herself time for a second thought, she rushed into the shop, pale, wild, desperate in gesture and expression, scowling portentously, and looking far better qualified to do fierce battle with a housebreaker than to stand smiling behind the counter, bartering small wares for a copper recompense. Any ordinary customer, indeed, would have turned his back and fled, and yet there was nothing fierce in Hepzibah's poor old heart, nor had she at that moment a single bitter thought against the world at large, or one individual man or woman. She wished them all well, but wished, too, that she herself were done with them, and in her quiet grave. The applicant by this time stood within the doorway. Coming freshly, as he did, out of the morning light, he appeared to have brought some of its cheery influences into the shop along with him. It was a slender young man, not more than one or two and twenty years old, with rather a grave and thoughtful expression for his years, but likewise a springy alacrity and vigour. These qualities were not only perceptible physically in his make and motions, but made themselves felt almost immediately in his character. A brown beard, not too silken in its texture, fringed his chin, but as yet without completely hiding it. He wore a short moustache, too, and his high, dark-featured countenance looked all the better for these natural ornaments. As for his dress, it was of the simplest kind, a summer sack of cheap and ordinary material, thin checkered pantaloons, and a straw hat, by no means of the finest braid. Oak Hall might have supplied his entire equipment. He was chiefly remarked as a gentleman, if such indeed he made any claim to be, by the rather remarkable whiteness and nicety of his clean linen. He met the scowl of old Hepzibah without apparent alarm, as having heretofore encountered it, and found it harmless. "'So, my dear Miss Pinchon,' said the daguerreotypist, for it was that sole other occupant of the seven-gabled mansion, "'I am glad to see that you have not shrunk from your good purpose. I merely look in to offer my best wishes.' and to ask if I can assist you any further in your preparations. People in difficulty and distress, or in any manner at odds with the world, can endure a vast amount of harsh treatment, and perhaps be only the stronger for it, whereas they give way at once before the simplest expression of what they perceive to be genuine sympathy. So it proved with poor Hepzibah, for when she saw the young man smile, looking so much the brighter on a thoughtful face, and heard his kindly tone, she broke first into a hysteric giggle, and then began to sob. "'Ah, Mr. Holgrave,' cried she, as soon as she could speak, "'I never can go through with it. Never, never, never. I wish I were dead, and in the old family tomb, with all my forefathers. With my father, and my mother, and my sister. Yes, and with my brother, who had far better find me there than here. The world is too chill and hard, and I am too old, and too feeble, and too hopeless. Oh, believe me, Miss Hepzibah, said the young man, quietly, these feelings will not trouble you any longer, 
after you are once fairly in the midst of your enterprise. They are unavoidable at this moment, standing, as you do, on the outer verge of your long seclusion, and peopling the world with ugly shapes, which you will soon find to be as unreal as the giant and ogres of a child's story-book. I find nothing so singular in life as that everything appears to lose its substance the instant one actually grapples with it. So it will be with what you think so terrible. "'But I am a woman,' said Hepzibah piteously. "'I was going to say a lady, but I consider that as past.' "'Well, no matter if it be past,' answered the artist, a strange gleam of half-hidden sarcasm flashing through the kindliness of his manner. "'Let it go. You are the better without it. I speak frankly, my dear Miss Pinchon, for are we not friends? I look upon this as one of the fortunate days of your life. It ends an epoch and begins one. Hitherto, the life-blood has been gradually chilling in your veins as you sat aloof within your circle of gentility, while the rest of the world was fighting out its battle with one kind of necessity or another. Henceforth, you will at least have the sense of healthy and natural effort for a purpose, and of lending your strength, be it great or small, to the united struggle of mankind. This is success, all the success that anybody meets with. "'It is natural enough, Mr. Holgrave, that you should have ideas like these,' rejoined Hepzibah, drawing up her gaunt figure with slightly offended dignity. "'You are a man, a young man, and brought up, I suppose, as almost everybody is nowadays, with a view to seeking your fortune. But I was born a lady, and have always lived one, no matter in what narrowness of means, always a lady.' "'But I was not born a gentleman, neither have I lived like one,' said Holgrave, slightly smiling. "'So, my dear madam, you will hardly expect me to sympathize with sensibilities of this kind, though, unless I deceive myself, I have some imperfect comprehension of them. These names of gentleman and lady had a meaning in the past history of the world, and conferred privileges, desirable or otherwise, on those entitled to bear them. In the present, and still more in the future condition of society, they imply not privilege, but restriction. "'These are new notions,' said the old gentlewoman, shaking her head. "'I shall never understand them, neither do I wish it.' "'We will cease to speak of them, then,' replied the artist, with a friendlier smile than his last one and I will leave you to feel whether it is not better to be a true woman than a lady. Do you really think, Miss Hepzibah, that any lady of your family has ever done a more heroic thing, since this house was built, than you are performing in it to-day? Never! And if the Pinchons had always acted so nobly, I doubt whether an old wizard Maul's anathema, of which you told me once, would have had much weight with providence against them. "'Ah, no, no,' said Hepzibah, not displeased at this allusion to the sombre dignity of an inherited curse. "'If old Maul's ghost, or a descendant of his, could see me behind the counter to-day, he would call it the fulfilment of his worst wishes. But I thank you for your kindness, Mr. Holgrave, and will do my utmost to be a good shopkeeper.' "'Pray do,' said Holgrave. "'And let me have the pleasure of being your first customer. "'I am about taking a walk to the seashore, "'before going to my rooms, "'where I misuse heaven's blessed sunshine "'by tracing out human features through its agency. "'A few of those biscuits dipped in sea-water "'will be just what I need for breakfast. "'What is the price of half a dozen?' "'Let me be a lady a moment longer,' "'replied Hepzibah, with a manner of antique stateliness, to which a melancholy smile lent a kind of grace. She put the biscuits into his hand, but rejected the compensation. "'A Pinchon must not, at all events, under her forefather's roof, receive money for a morsel of bread from her only friend.' Holgrave took his departure, leaving her, for the moment, with spirits not quite so much depressed. Soon, however, they had subsided nearly to their former 
dead level. With a beating heart she listened to the footsteps of early passengers, which now began to be frequent along the street. Once or twice they seemed to linger, these strangers, or neighbours, as the case might be, were looking at the display of toys and petty commodities in Hepzibah's shop-window. She was doubly tortured, in part with a sense of overwhelming shame that strange and unloving eyes should have the privilege of gazing, and partly because the idea occurred to her, with ridiculous importunity, that the window was not arranged so skilfully, nor nearly to so much advantage as it might have been. It seemed as if the whole fortune or failure of her shop might depend on the display of a different set of articles, or substituting a fairer apple for one which appeared to be specked. So she made the change, and straightway fancied that everything was spoiled by it, not recognising that it was the nervousness of the juncture, and her own native squeamishness as an old maid, that wrought all the seeming mischief. Anon there was an encounter, just at the doorstep, betwixt two labouring men, as their rough voices denoted them to be. After some slight talk about their own affairs, one of them chanced to notice the shop-window, and directed the other's attention to it. "'See here,' cried he, "'what do you think of this? Trade seems to be looking up in Pinchon Street.' "'Well, well, this is a sight, to be sure,' exclaimed the other. "'In the old Pinchon house, and underneath the Pinchon elm. Who would have thought it? Old maid Pinchon is setting up a scent shop.' "'Will she make it go, think you, Dixie?' said his friend. "'I don't call it a very good stand. There's another shop just round the corner.' "'Make it go?' cried Dixie, with a most contemptuous expression, as if the very idea were impossible to be conceived. "'Not a bit of it. Why, her face! I've seen it, for I dug her garden for her one year. Her face is enough to frighten the old Nick himself, if he had ever so great a mind to trade with her. People can't stand it, I tell you. She scowls dreadfully, reason or none, out of pure ugliness of temper.' "'Well, that's not so much matter,' remarked the other man. "'These sour-tempered folks are mostly handy at business, and know pretty well what they are about. But, as you say, I don't think she'll do much. This business of keeping scent shops is overdone, like all other kinds of trade, handicraft, and bodily labour. I know it, to my cost. My wife kept a scent shop three months, and lost five dollars on her outlay.' "'Poor business,' responded Dixie, in a tone as if he were shaking his head. "'Poor business!' For some reason or other, not very easy to analyse, there had hardly been so bitter a pang in all her previous misery about the matter as what thrilled Hepzibah's heart on overhearing the above conversation. The testimony in regard to her scowl was frightfully important— it seemed to hold up her image wholly relieved from the false light of her self-partialities, and so hideous that she dared not look at it. She was absurdly hurt, moreover, by the slight and idle effect that her setting up shop, an event of such breathless interest to herself, appeared to have upon the public, of which these two men were the nearest representatives. A glance, a passing word or two, a coarse laugh— and she was doubtless forgotten before they turned the corner. They cared nothing for her dignity, and just as little for her degradation. Then, also, the augury of ill-success, uttered from the sure wisdom of experience, fell upon her half-dead hope like a clod into a grave. The man's wife had already tried the same experiment, and failed. How could the born lady, the recluse of half a lifetime, utterly unpractised in the world, at sixty years of age, how could she ever dream of succeeding, when the hard, vulgar, keen, busy, hackneyed New England woman had lost five dollars on her little outlay? Success presented itself as an impossibility, and the hope of it as a wild hallucination. Some malevolent spirit, doing his utmost to drive Hepzibah mad, unrolled before her imagination a kind of panorama, representing the great thoroughfare of a city all astir with customers. 
so many and so magnificent shops as there were, groceries, toy shops, dry goods stores, with their immense panes of plate glass, their gorgeous fixtures, their vast and complete assortments of merchandise, in which fortunes had been invested, and those noble mirrors at the farther end of each establishment, doubling all this wealth by a brightly burnished vista of unrealities. On one side of the street this splendid bazaar, with a multitude of perfumed and glossy salesmen, smirking, smiling, bowing, and measuring out the goods. On the other, the dusky old house of the Seven Gables, with the antiquated shop-window under its projecting story, and Hepzibah herself, in a gown of rusty black silk, behind the counter, scowling at the world as it went by. This mighty contrast thrust itself forward as a fair expression of the odds against which she was to begin her struggle for a subsistence. Success? Preposterous! She would never think of it again. The house might just as well be buried in an eternal fog, while all the other houses had the sunshine on them, for not a foot would ever cross the threshold, nor a hand so much as try the door. But, at this instant, the shop bell, right over her head, tinkled as if it were bewitched. The old gentlewoman's heart seemed to be attached to the same steel spring, for it went through a series of sharp jerks in unison with the sound. The door was thrust open, although no human form was perceptible on the other side of the half-window. Hepzibah, nevertheless, stood at a gaze, with her hands clasped, looking very much as if she had summoned up an evil spirit, and were afraid, yet resolved, to hazard the encounter. "'Heaven help me!' she groaned mentally. "'Now is my hour of need!' The door, which moved with difficulty on its creaking and rusty hinges, being forced quite open, a square and sturdy little urchin became apparent, with cheeks as red as an apple. He was clad rather shabbily, but, as it seemed, more owing to his mother's carelessness than his father's poverty, in a blue apron, very wide and short trousers, shoes somewhat out at the toes, and a chip hat, with the frizzles of his curly hair sticking through its crevices. A book in a small slate, under his arm, indicated that he was on his way to school. He stared at Hepzibah a moment, as an elder customer than himself would have been likely enough to do, not knowing what to make of the tragic attitude and queer scowl wherewith she regarded him. "'Well, child,' said she, taking heart at sight of a personage so little formidable, "'well, my child, what did you wish for?' "'That Jim Crow there in the window!' answered the urchin, holding out a cent, and pointing to the gingerbread figure that had attracted his notice, as he loitered along to school. "'The one that has not a broken foot?' So Hepzibah put forth her lank arm, and, taking the effigy from the shop-window, delivered it to her first customer. "'No matter for the money,' said she, giving him a little push towards the door, for her old gentility was contumaciously squeamish at sight of the copper coin, and besides it seemed such pitiful meanness to take the child's pocket-money in exchange for a bit of stale gingerbread. "'No matter for the cent. You are welcome to Jim Crow.' The child, staring with round eyes at this instance of liberality, wholly unprecedented in his large experience of cent-shops, took the man of gingerbread and quitted the premises. No sooner had he reached the sidewalk, little cannibal that he was, than Jim Crow's head was in his mouth. As he had not been careful to shut the door, Hepzibah was at the pains of closing it after him, with a pettish ejaculation or two about the troublesomeness of young people, and particularly of small boys. She had just placed another representative of the renowned Jim Crow at the window, when again the shop bell tinkled clamorously, and again the door being thrust open, with its characteristic jerk and jar, disclosed the same sturdy little urchin who, precisely two minutes ago, had made his exit. The crumbs and discoloration of the cannibal feast, as yet hardly consummated, were exceedingly visible about his mouth. "'What is it now, child?' asked the maiden lady, rather impatiently. "'Did you come back to shut the door?' "'No!' 
answered the urchin, pointing to the figure that had just been put up. "'I want that other Jim Crow.' "'Well, here it is for you,' said Hepzibah, reaching it down, but recognizing that this pertinacious customer would not quit her on any other terms, so long as she had a gingerbread figure in her shop, she partly drew back her extended hand. "'Where is the scent?' The little boy had the scent ready, but, like a true-born Yankee, would have preferred the better bargain to the worse. Looking somewhat chagrined, he put the coin into Hepzibah's hand, and departed, sending the second Jim Crow in quest of the former one. The new shopkeeper dropped the first solid result of her commercial enterprise into the till. It was done. The sordid stain of that copper coin could never be washed away from her palm. The little schoolboy, aided by the impish figure of the negro dancer, had wrought an irreparable ruin. The structure of ancient aristocracy had been demolished by him, even as if his childish gripe had torn down the seven-gabled mansion. Now let Hepzibah turn the old Pinchon portraits with their faces to the wall, and take the map of her eastern territory to kindle the kitchen fire and blow up the flame with the empty breath of her ancestral traditions. What had she to do with ancestry? Nothing, no more than with posterity. No lady now, but simply Hepzibah Pinchon, a forlorn old maid and keeper of a scent shop. Nevertheless, even while she paraded these ideas somewhat ostentatiously through her mind, it is altogether surprising what a calmness had come over her. The anxiety and misgivings which had tormented her, whether asleep or in melancholy daydreams, ever since her project began to take an aspect of solidity, had now vanished quite away. She felt the novelty of her position, indeed, but no longer with disturbance or affright. Now and then there came a thrill of almost youthful enjoyment. It was the invigorating breath of a fresh outward atmosphere after the long torpor and monotonous seclusion of her life. So wholesome is effort, so miraculous the strength that we do not know of. The healthiest glow that Hepzibah had known for years had come now in the dreaded crisis, when, for the first time, she had put forth her hand to help herself. The little circlet of the schoolboy's copper coin, dim and lustreless though it was, with the small services which it had been doing here and there about the world, had proved a talisman, fragrant with good, and deserving to be set in gold and worn next to her heart. It was as potent, and perhaps endowed with the same kind of efficacy, as a galvanic ring. Hepzibah, at all events, was indebted to its subtle operation both in body and spirit. So much the more, as it inspired her with energy to get some breakfast— at which, still the better to keep up her courage, she allowed herself an extra spoonful in her infusion of black tea. Her introductory day of shopkeeping did not run on, however, without many and serious interruptions of this mood of cheerful vigour. As a general rule, Providence seldom vouchsafes to mortals any more than just that degree of encouragement which suffices to keep them at a reasonably full exertion of their powers. In the case of our old gentlewoman, after the excitement of new effort had subsided, the despondency of her whole life threatened, ever and anon, to return. It was like the heavy mass of clouds which we may often see, obscuring the sky, and making a grey twilight everywhere, until, towards nightfall, it yields temporarily to a glimpse of sunshine. But, always, the envious cloud strives to gather again across the streak of celestial azure. Customers came in, as the forenoon advanced, but rather slowly. In some cases, too, it must be owned, with little satisfaction either to themselves or Miss Hepzibah, nor, on the whole, with an aggregate of very rich emolument to the till. A little girl, sent by her mother to match a skein of cotton thread, of a peculiar hue, took one that the near-sighted old lady pronounced extremely like, but soon came running back with a blunt and cross message, that it would not do, and besides was very rotten. Then there was a pale, care-wrinkled woman, not old but haggard, and already with streaks of grey among her hair, 
like silver ribbons, one of those women, naturally delicate, whom you at once recognize as worn to death by a brute, probably a drunken brute, of a husband, and at least nine children. She wanted a few pounds of flour, and offered the money, which the decayed gentlewoman silently rejected, and gave the poor soul better measure than if she had taken it. Shortly afterwards, a man in a blue cotton frock, much soiled, came in and bought a pipe, filling the whole shop, meanwhile, with the hot odour of strong drink, not only exhaled in the torrid atmosphere of his breath, but oozing out of his entire system like an inflammable gas. It was impressed on Hepzibah's mind that this was the husband of the care-wrinkled woman. He asked for a paper of tobacco, and as she had neglected to provide herself with the article, her brutal customer dashed down his newly bought pipe and left the shop, muttering some unintelligible words, which had the tone and bitterness of a curse. Hereupon Hepzibah threw up her eyes, unintentionally scowling in the face of Providence. No less than five persons during the forenoon inquired for ginger-beer, or root-beer, or any drink of a similar brewage, and, obtaining nothing of the kind, went off in an exceedingly bad humour. Three of them left the door open, and the other two pulled it so spitefully in going out that the little bell played the very deuce with Hepzibah's nerves. A round, bustling, fire-ruddy housewife of the neighbourhood burst breathless into the shop, fiercely demanding yeast, and when the poor gentlewoman, with her cold shyness of manner, gave her hot customer to understand that she did not keep the article, this very capable housewife took upon herself to administer a regular rebuke. "'A cent shop, and no yeast,' quoth she. "'That will never do. Who ever heard of such a thing? Your loaf will never rise, no more than mine will to-day. You had better shut up shop at once.' "'Well,' said Hepzibah, heaving a deep sigh, "'perhaps I had.' Several times, moreover, besides the above instance, her ladylike sensibilities were seriously infringed upon by the familiar, if not rude, tone with which people addressed her. They evidently considered themselves not merely her equals, but her patrons and superiors. Now, Hepzibah had unconsciously flattered herself with the idea— that there would be a gleam or halo, of some kind or other, about her person, which would ensure an obeisance to her sterling gentility, or at least a tacit recognition of it. On the other hand, nothing tortured her more intolerably than when this recognition was too prominently expressed. To one or two rather officious offers of sympathy, her responses were little short of acrimonious, and, we regret to say, Hepzibah was thrown into a positively unchristian state of mind by the suspicion that one of her customers was drawn to the shop not by any real need of the article which she pretended to seek, but by a wicked wish to stare at her. The vulgar creature was determined to see for herself what sort of a figure a mildewed piece of aristocracy, after wasting all the bloom and much of the decline of her life apart from the world, would cut behind a counter. In this particular case, however mechanical and innocuous it might be at other times, Hepzibah's contortion of brow served her in good stead. "'I was never so frightened in my life,' said the curious customer, in describing the incident to one of her acquaintances. "'She's a real old vixen, take my word of it. She says little, to be sure. But if you could only see the mischief in her eye!' On the whole, therefore, her new experience led our decayed gentlewoman to very disagreeable conclusions as to the temper and manners of what she termed the lower classes, whom heretofore she had looked down upon with a gentle and pitying complacence, as herself occupying a sphere of unquestionable superiority. But, unfortunately, she had likewise to struggle against a bitter emotion of a directly opposite kind— a sentiment of virulence, we mean, towards the idle aristocracy to which it had so recently been her pride to belong. When a lady, in a delicate and costly summer garb, with a floating veil and gracefully swaying gown, 
and, altogether, an ethereal lightness that made you look at her beautifully slippered feet, to see whether she trod on the dust or floated in the air, when such a vision happened to pass through this retired street, leaving it tenderly and delusively fragrant with her passage, as if a bouquet of tea-roses had been borne along, then again, it is to be feared, old Hepzibah's scowl could no longer vindicate itself entirely on the plea of near-sightedness. "'For what end?' thought she, giving vent to that feeling of hostility which is the only real abasement of the poor in presence of the rich. "'For what good end, in the wisdom of Providence, does that woman live? Must the whole world toil, that the palms of her hands may be kept white and delicate?' Then, ashamed and penitent, she hid her face. "'May God forgive me,' said she. Doubtless God did forgive her. But, taking the inward and outward history of the first half-day into consideration, Hepzibah began to fear that the shop would prove her ruin, in a moral and religious point of view, without contributing very essentially towards even her temporal welfare. End of chapter.